A warm welcome to you all. What's so particularly pleasing today is that we come from all over the world. Many countries are represented here this morning. My name is Dr. John Caro. I was a family GP here in the south of England, but for the last 20 years or more, I've been helping with the growth of our charity, Prime. And today we're a team of four friends as Richard, Tim and Andy, but they will be introducing themselves later. All of us here this morning have this in common, that our life calling has been to care for those who suffer because of illness, whether physical or mental. We would not be here unless we had a heart for people and a calling to help them through their trials. And indeed, it really has been a trial for all of us in the last year. The pandemic has hosted global suffering on a scale that many of us have never known before. And the cost to communities, families and individuals has been immense, as we all know. It's not surprising that the load has been particularly heavy for healthcare workers, us colleagues, our friends, and we must admit, on many of us here today, but we all have a second factor that binds us together. Each one of us is a beloved child of God. And Jesus promises to walk with us, beside us, in the darkest of trials. The Bible promises us that he is a very present help in trouble. The title of today's gathering, taken from Psalm 46, which I do highly recommend you to read reflectively later today. Prime Partnerships in International Medical Education is a worldwide community of healthcare professionals who seek to express the values, indeed the presence of Jesus through the practice of our medical care, and particularly to teach and inspire others to practice whole person care mind, body and spirit are all equally key facets of every human. We're a family of volunteers who have been teaching in around 60 countries through although the pandemic has put all visits on hold for the moment. One special aspect of our work has been to support each other and this is the inspiration for today's seminar. So may I now invite Dr. Andy Mott to share with us. Thank you, Andy. Hi, my name is Dr. Andy Mott. Um, I was a general practitioner, family doctor in a semi-rural practice on the south coast of the UK for over 30 years until I retired in 2007. Um, I then went on to be the GP sub-dean and an honorary clinical tutor at Brighton and Sussex Medical School for the next five years. And then I thought I'd fully retired, but um, a month ago I took up gainful employment again and I've been working for the NHS as a COVID vaccinator, working three six hour shifts a week. Um, I've been involved with this project for the last three years, um, presenting seminars entitled Compassion Without Burnout to UK medical students and junior doctors. So, what are the aims of our, of our session today? First, to review the benefits and challenges of providing compassionate care. What, what we understand together by, by the, the phrase compassionate care. To recognise the problem of burnout. There are ways in which we might relieve or minimise the, the, the danger of becoming burned out to consider what makes us resilient and whether that actually is a very helpful concept. And finally, to consider what difference knowledge of Jesus makes. And this is not just an add-on. This is the strand, the, the 
the very compassion of Jesus himself is the strand that runs through the whole of our presentation. As, as John has already said, our title today comes from Psalm 46. And we recognize that many of us are coming this morning hurt, damaged, bewildered by what's happened over the, over the last year. Uh, our world has been shaken. As the psalm says, it's been shaken to its foundations violently by this pandemic. And it's the truth that not only does God promise to be a very present help in trouble, but he has been proved to be that. And it's that truth that motivates our fervent prayer that each of us may experience something of his healing touch and grace. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Tim Patton now. Tim. My name's Tim Patton. I'm a, a GP. I've been a, a family doctor in Southampton for 33 years um, coming this Friday. Uh, I also teach at the Southampton Medical School. I've been a prime tutor for um, 12 years. So, um, first of all, we need to consider what actually is compassion. And I would like to invite those who would like to, to use the chat function. And like to just, uh, if you'd like to say, what is, what do you mean by compassion? Please, please type away. Thank you. Yes, so we're starting with care. Being alongside people, being present, suffering with people. That's, 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 that's a lovely way of looking at it. Looking with care at the whole person in front of you. Remembering their love by God. Practical love. Yes, this is putting it into practice. Kindness. Empathy. Moved by suffering to action. Okay, you see the suffering and you act. Concern with suffering of others, the intention of helping them. That's really important. There's the concern, but then there's the intention to actually do something about it. Lovely. Well, well that's, that's great. Practical love. We've got some, some fantastic definitions, and there are so many different ways of, of, of putting it. So I'll, I'll come up with one. Recognition of suffering and action. Okay. So people have researched this a lot, and as you see, there's been a huge number of articles and writing about what compassion is in the healthcare. And here's just one of them. The important thing here is the empathic response. And I'll just come on to what those two things mean. So there's, there's the empathy and there's the response. Okay, so this is a bit of a long sentence, but I think it's important. So the first half is the empathy, the understanding someone's suffering. The walking in, in someone's shoes, putting yourself in their situation. But then the second part is the response, the willingness to help that person. The only thing I would take some exception to is this very last part in order to find a solution to their situation. And of course, as healthcare professionals, we do often and often can find a solution. But I think at the heart is even when there is no solution, and of course, friends, we all know situations when we can find no medical or other solution to our patient's suffering, standing with them. As Jesus said to his disciples, watch with me, stay here and watch with me. And I think this is so central to compassion. This is a painting you may be surprised by Picasso. Pablo Picasso, in his earlier stages, as the anatomy is more or less correct. Um, and you can see a picture here, and it's called um, With Science and Charity, or maybe better translated, With Skill and With Tender Care. And you can see this is at the end of the 19th century. The gentleman on the left is undoubtedly a, a, a medic, providing the skill that was available then, taking the patient's pulse but also being there with the patient sitting, hand contact. The lady on the right we take to be a nurse. Um, we assume that the child is the of the very sick patient's child, so that the nurse is not just bringing her child into work. So she's providing whole person care in that sense. She's providing a drink, but she's also, she's doing as Jesus has asked us, she's watching with the patient. They both are. Fast forward 120 odd years to a more modern setting. I think one thing that's really important is I do a lot of teaching of first year medical students. 
and people, whether they're nurses, doctors, physios, other health professionals, they all enter the profession wanting to help people, to heal people and to relieve suffering. But one of the conditions of the medical education is it's very easy to beat this out of you, to consider um, the patient's anatomy, to think of themselves in terms of anatomy or in terms of their physiology, their biochemistry, or in terms of their imaging. And it's so easy to lose the picture of the patient, the whole patient in front of you. And I'm going to hand over to Andy. So what are the dimensions of compassion? Well, this slide is a helpful reminder that compassion needs to be shown not only to our patients, who of course are the prime source, the, the prime focus of our compassion, but also to our colleagues. We have a duty of care, perhaps an informal of duty of care, to reach out to those of our colleagues who are struggling, to be aware of how our, our co colleagues are, are coping. And I must say, it's been a very moving part of some of the news reports from ITU's coping with the COVID crisis, of seeing uh, the leader of the team going round to each member of her team every so often, just checking that they're okay, that they're coping. But finally, we have a duty of care to ourselves. There's a lovely phrase from one of my favorite poets, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who used to beat himself up quite regularly. And he says this, my own heart, let me more have pity on. We need to be compassionate to ourselves. And this is a concept that we'll expand later on in, in the presentation. But there's a very good phrase. It's a little bit corny and a bit hackneyed, but it has meaning, which I've heard a lot. It's okay not to be okay. What are the effects of compassion or empathy? And I know we, we can perhaps discuss the difference in meaning of these two words, but for the sake of research, the two words are interchangeable when you look at research papers. So effectiveness of empathy, read effectiveness of compassion in patient care. This is a systematic review carried out by the British Journal of General Practitioners in 2013. This is the UK. Looking at seven papers published in the previous 15 years of the effect of compassionate care. And I think the point I want to make from this slide is that these are not touchy-feely outcomes. These are real, objective, practical outcomes. Uh, I particularly draw your attention to that final outcome, more patient enablement, the ability of patients to improve their own health. This is supported very much by research from the Department of General Practice in Edinburgh, where they looked at patients' own definitions of compassionate care. Very high on the list of patients' own definitions of compassionate care was active involvement in decision-making about their own management. This is an aspect of care easily overlooked by us professionals. This is from some research from uh, the Journal of Family Practice from 2000, so 20 years old. Um, but nonetheless, these findings hold true for now. The title of their paper was The Impact of Patient-Centred Care. And I, I guess that patient-centred care is another good general definition of compassionate care. I draw your attention to the practical outcomes of this sort of care. Fewer diagnostic tests and referrals. I think that's particularly interesting and, and I wonder why that should be. I think one of the possible answers is that Compassionate care includes active listening to our patients, which enables accurate history taking, enhancing the ability to pick up subtle diagnostic clues otherwise missed. A less well-known aspect of compassionate care is the benefits of compassion to the one who gives it. Early in my training, I was often cautioned against becoming emotionally involved with my patients and 
for emotionally involved, I read compassionate. The Im implication was that being too compassionate could be harmful, especially to me. But interestingly, over the recent years, there's a growing body of research which shows quite the opposite. Rather than causing burnout, compassionate care has been shown to protect against it. And this has been very much borne out by a, a popular book, which is quite common on, on the bookshelves of our bookshops, written by Paul Gilbert, a psychologist, called The Compassionate Mind. I'll give you some time to just read what he said, particularly underlining that first paragraph where he says that compassion builds confidence and helps build meaningful relationships. In that second paragraph, developing compassion has been found to subdue anger and increase courage. These are very interesting findings and in some ways have been counterintuitive to a lot of the thinking, a lot of the teaching around compassionate care and its possible implications for us who are giving it. In reality, we know that there can be obstacles to behaving compassionately. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. John Caro now to talk a little bit more about this aspect. The point is that compassion can only come from the state of our heart and looking after ourselves, therefore, is of top priority. It's very difficult to be compassionate for the patient when you're angry with your bank manager. You know what I mean? And so what we thought we might do is to spend a little time thinking through in groups, what is it that feeds our own inner well-being? So it's worth thinking about factors in our lives that help us be the people we want to be. But it's also worth thinking about what are the factors that get in the way? So what we're going to do is to break up into some uh, breakout groups for just for 10 minutes and think this through with a small group of friends and for each of us to wonder what it is in our own lives that, that help and hinder us. So perhaps um, we could go into the breakout groups now and I would just ask that the leaders appoint a spokesman to feed back to us afterwards. And when there are so many of us, obviously, when we do feedback, it would be nice if we just had one or two brief points. And then if there are more things to say, we'll go back to the, the groups again the second time. But only one or two brief points from each group, please. Welcome back, everybody. Everybody there? Yeah. Michael. Michael's group. Thank you. Yeah, Brian Hopkins with, with Michael Harper and Tracy. We, we felt that being part of a team was really important uh, for compassionate care. Um, and when the team is working well, it's actually very sustaining. Um, and when the team isn't going well, then actually it can be very destructive. Um, and we also uh, acknowledge faith, uh, even though that that's absolutely faith was really important to all of us um, but it wasn't like a panacea which just made it all okay but it was really significant for us our faith thank, thank you. you what about alex's group hi so uh my name is mary i'm just feeding back for, from alex's group so um ours was was very much um the recognition of preparing ourselves for the working day whatever that looks like um, the importance of the time with God, um, spending time uh, in, in Bible study and, and prayer, but also the importance of um, things like exercise. And, and two members of the group talked about how they would either walk or cycle to, to work, praying or, or listening to music. So that importance of, of taking Jesus into the working day. Isn't that interesting, exercise? And I know where that came from because Alex is well known in Prime for her um, 
uh, brutal demand that we all do exercise every morning at a conference. So the good thing about having a Zoom conference is that we're not allowed to actually get in, into the same room with Alex and get forced to do press-ups. So that's, that's one of the reliefs this year. Um, Tim, why don't you, Tim's group feedback. Yeah, yes, um, um, Margaret is going to feedback for us. That's me. Uh, we had those things mentioned, but also um, how your home life was, relationships at home, um, relationships with colleagues, um, not having big problems in your life. If you had things interfering at the back of your mind, then it was harder to be compassionate. And tried to um, brand a bit about part of the team that if people weren't critical, if they're being compassionate as well, then that really helped. Yeah. That's interesting. Criti somebody else mentioned criticism as a or negative, quiet disapproval as a very powerful blocker, which actually gives one a, a, a discipline about how careful one has to be in correcting somebody. If there's something, if you are in charge, how do you how do you put them on the right path lovingly rather than critically? Rob Sadler's group. I think um, a lot of uh, what people have already said, we discussed too. I mean, I think one of the things that really came out was that um, was that the, the concept of being kind to each other would actually help um, you provide compassionate care, that you actually, if you actually felt yourself that you were valued um, and the opposite as a barrier. Isn't, it's the same, the same as teamwork. One person, Andrea, perhaps you could share from my group what you were saying uh, and what Rebecca was saying about uh, getting together in her group. Andrea, for my group. Um, we talked about the importance of faith and letting Jesus fill us with compassion. We talked about practical things of spending time in, in the garden, in nature, just things that help us to rebalance and we talked about recognizing that we ourselves can be struggling so with maybe bereavement but also that workload or stress at work can make us dehumanized and the importance of trying to recognize where we're at rather than blaming ourselves but recognizing it for what it is that's very important just to other people i'm sure other people get that feeling of honesty with yourself. Um, somebody was saying in our group that um, when you suddenly realized that he was getting short with a patient, that time had come to, for things to be changed. I'm sure none of you have ever, ever been short with a patient. I mean, you know, you're perfect, I know. Uh-huh. <laughs> All of us have suffered. And the other thing that came up in our group, so I should say also, is that sense of relief, quite honestly, when a patient didn't turn up because you had a short break, you know, and, and so breaks are important. Uh, Roy, Roy, who is in spokesman for Roy's group? So on behalf of Roy and Dawn and myself, we spoke about what happens when we get so busy and the busier we get, we actually focus more on our own sense of survival and the interruptions or being compassionate to other people seems to um, take us away from our busyness um, we said actually to give yourself permission to stop to offer some of yourself to somebody else is actually can be incredibly releasing but there's that um, sense in us of panic if we did that you know we won't be able to finish our jobs we won't be able to do this if we stop and give um, give something of ourselves to others so we said that actually that permission giving um, is actually really important I love that giving yourself permission to hurt permission to take a break we're all of us have has felt very driven I think the mm -hmm. The current stress and the, and the management are under stress themselves and the sense of being pushed to fulfill a task is very powerful in this, mm. yeah? So permission, mm. it's okay not to be okay. And in fact, that has become one of the sort of, if I can use the word mantras in our local hospital, it's okay not to be okay. Mm. 
Andy's group? Nearly there. Uh, yes. Um, Janet was going to feedback for us. Janet. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, I suppose in, uh, in addition to what everybody has said, I think probably the um, key factor on both sides then for what helps us be compassionate is having enough time, um, having enough time to spend uh, with patients and with the day-to-day. And then on the on the other side as well, actually having the lack of time and time constraints that are imposed on us um, becomes a hindrance. Um, otherwise, I think everybody has said so far the things that we talked about. So time being the big big issue, really having plenty of time and then having not enough time. Can I suggest that sleep is vital, and to work late into the night or to get up early in order to achieve those awful things I've got to do actually is self-productive. Terribly practical, and it's the same thing with eating and drinking. How many juniors skip lunch? And there's one more group, and that's Anne, uh, 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 but, oh, I think we've had all the groups. Anyone not been represented? Um, uh, my group, uh, John. Well, thank but you, Janet, I'm just, sorry. You right. just pinched the last few that I think Yannick um, Yasek was going to be able to pull out of the bag. It's broken already, I think. <laughs> what we have been talking. Thank you. I suggest that it's very, very practical and it's worth looking at in your own busy lives the practical things that get in the way or help and emphasize those and do something about it. So, may I hand back to Tim? Um, yes, yeah, so um, we didn't actually get on to in sharing in feedback um, about what makes us less compassionate, but in fact, so often it's just the opposite of what makes us compassionate. So, what are the stresses on? I'm talking about doctors, but I'm sure this could be applied to whoever, any healthcare professional. What is it that makes the job of a healthcare professional diff particularly difficult at the moment? Well, I'm sure a lot of these things that you can recognise very easily in your own professional lives, the, the, the time, the pressure of having to get through patients, lack of support, expectations of patients. And it's interesting, even in a, in a, in a hospital environment, people can feel very isolated. And I can certainly identify that cases become so, can be so complex, complex sometimes you feel your brain is frying with trying to get everything together. This is a group of, of doctors who had suffered stress and difficulties. And they were interviewed by psychiatrists, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who reported back just what some of these doctors were feeling like. And this loss of belonging, just being a number on a rotor, a role, not a person, feeling that they no longer felt human. How sad that they felt no one cared about their life when they were caring so much about the life, patients they were looking after. Taking it further, there's some really difficult things, and maybe some of you can identify experiences here with your own um, current or previous professional lives. Bullying frustration, powerlessness, and again, no one you can share your problems with. It's very interesting that I've, my medical mistakes, and we all make mistakes, I've never found it very easy to share with my wife, and it's, I can share other things, but there's something about having to share with a colleague, but sometimes we can be ashamed and feel we can't, that this can't be, there's a blame culture. And this, is, this can be such a stressful thing, if you can't share with your colleagues about the, the negative things that go on in your professional lives. Lots of figures about the effects of well-being on sickness, but the one I would like to draw your attention to is the bottom one, that of the very large number of days lost from work from the British National Health Service, almost 30% were due to stress. COVID has produced fresh challenges. This is not an environment that I've worked in. I've been very fortunate not to have had to work in this environment of the intensive care. I'd like to just draw your attention to the lovely act of having the, the photographs, because you cannot see a face, obviously, in this setting, but having that, seeing that there is a face behind there, knowing what that face looks like, must be so helpful. So 
the additional stress is even apart from the increased work in the COVID era is time off due to COVID or self-isolation because of, of being in contact with COVID. Numbers are huge and this puts huge stress on the staff who are left behind, even fewer people to deal at these critical times. And there's been recent interviews on the effect of COVID on the effect of intensive care units, intensive therapy unit staff. And only just over half of staff reported good well-being. What do we mean by not good well-being? Well, of the remaining 42% with significant mental health difficulties, the vast majority had clinically recognised post-traumatic stress disorder which is a really difficult work-related condition, well known for people who've come out from the armed forces, but increasingly recognised in um, hospital staff. And others had additional features such as depression, alcohol misuse. So there is a huge problem. I'm now going to hand over to Andy. So in the face of this these very startling facts and, and data um, coming out of research, how do we begin to consider our own mental health and well-being? Well, as good healthcare professionals, we begin with diagnosis. And a very useful diagnostic tool to aid reflection on our own stress is the so-called stress curve. This is based on the work of two psychologists, Yerkes and Dodson, working in the 1920s. And following on from their research, they formulated a law which states that performance increases with physiological or mental stress or pressure, but only to a point. And this can be expressed as a curve where performance is plotted against stress or pressure. Now, this can be very positive. As we all know, stress or pressure is a good motivator. So as stress or pressure increases, so performance improves to an optimum where creativity and productivity are at a peak. But beyond this point, increasing stress or pressure takes its toll. And if left unchecked or unmanaged, leads very quickly to burnout. And at this point, I'd just like to attribute the shape of this curve to Tracy books. This curve is expressed as an ordinary bell distribution curve. But talking to people who have actually suffered burnout, they will tell you that the actual descent into burnout is very rapid. Um, and that's why our curve for this presentation looks like this. So how do we use this? as a diagnostic tool? Well, by asking one or two pertinent questions. And I'm going to model this with Dr. Tim. Tim, where do you think you are on the curve and how do you know? So I'm, I'm currently, I think I'm very comfortably on that for my um, GP work, my family doctor work, I'm on the comforts um, part. I feel things are quite relaxing. I think for my university work, I'm more on the stretch having to adapt and get many other people to adapt to online learning has been really quite an exciting experience. So re really happy at the moment. But I, I gather from talking to you that if I'd asked you a year ago, it might have been a different answer. It was indeed a different answer a year ago. Um, a year ago, um, I was working from home um, because I had acquired COVID, um, probably at the Prime Conference. I was reasonably well but I was under enormous amount of stress. I was worried about the COVID. I was worried about the effect it was going to have on my family. I was having to adapt to home working, um, not only having to do everything on the phone with my patients rather than seeing people, but also having to adapt to some really um, poor remote technology that was there at the time for, for home working. And on top of that, the huge daily guidelines were coming in, conflicting, um, and some which really were quite distressing, and I think quite frankly wrong about how we should be managing COVID. And so I was very much on the downside, on the strain, 
well onto the strain. Um, and how did you actually recognise where you were on the curve a year ago? Uh, well, it took one of my partners, really, to, to point out that I was um, probably not as quite as well as I thought I was. Um, and I was acting sometimes in a rather stressed manner. Uh, we had all decided as a, as a partnership to um, not have our and to give up our annual leave because of COVID. We all had booked time. It was coming up to Easter, but it was it was suggested I should take the time off. And that was really helpful. Brilliant. Thank you. And finally, that 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 other question, that other person question, having recognised where you are or where you were on the curve and, and recognising you needed to move. How did you move? Well, I really, it was, it was just, I think I sort of, I think I have read, I think it's the week of having, having some time off. I still carried on actually um, looking at all the guidelines and getting myself up to date. Um, but but uh, yeah, having that space was really important. Great. Thank you, Tim. So what I'm going to suggest is that we go back into our breakout groups for the next 10 minutes to answer these questions in our groups. The leaders of the groups have these questions, so um, to be, remind you. So the next 10 minutes discussing these two questions. How do we find the resources to ease our stress and prevent burnout from occurring? Well, I think it's helpful to identify potential sources of help and support under two headings. Internal, what can I do to help myself? External, what help is available from others? So let's to start with concentrate on those internal areas of support, what I can do to help myself. And it's interesting, a, a literature review produced by the UK Society of Occupational Medicine in 2018, identified issues around life-work balance. We've already mentioned that. Tim's already mm -hmm. mentioned that. Life-work balance as being of crucial importance in reducing work-related stress. So these are some interesting and pertinent questions to ask ourselves about issues around life-work balance. What support networks and what coping strategies do you have? Secondly, what nurtures, refreshes or revives you? And I guess the answer to this question are around creative activities or recreational activities. And certainly this is where our faith is of particular importance. So another good question is what coping strategies have you heard your colleagues use? It's, it's very interesting hearing the banter between students or between junior doctors saying, well, you know, I found this house. You know, you could try this. So it, it's well worth looking to our colleagues and finding out what it is that helps them. And finally, what support networks have your colleagues been able to establish? And I think this is a particular value coming into a new job or a new appointment and finding out just what is available locally and I'll talk more about this a little bit later. So it's another opportunity to go into breakout groups to consider and reflect on these questions over the next five minutes. So this is just a reminder of, of the external sources of support. So what help can we look to others for? And I would certainly encourage you to, to look around you and see what your employer might provide. Certainly in the UK, the NHS is beginning to wake up to the, to the, the, the realization that, that staff needs proper support. And in the UK, there are various individuals who have particular responsibilities, some of them which are, are pastoral in nature. And I mentioned one here, Speak Up Guardian. But um, I also want to mention uh, something which uh, an individual who's becoming increasingly important. Many hospitals now 
have um, employed folk who have specific pastoral responsibility for junior doctors. Uh, I find that very encouraging. So I don't know what your situation is in your in your various countries, but it is worth asking around and just seeing what what support there is. Secondly, specific Christian support. And again, here in the UK, uh, the Christian Medical Fellowship have set up in the last year or so a pastoral care and well-being team um, who are very happy to receive um, confidential uh, phone calls or requests, email requests for help and support. Um, and I, I've spoken to the leader of this, this team who's very happy for their um, website address to be um, broadcast today. So there it is, wellbeing at cmf.org.uk. And, and finally, there are generic websites out there um, to help with burnout prevention and treatment. And there's just one example there. Of course, this comes with the, the usual health care warning of, of testing the provenance of websites before um, actually uh, going, going there and, and taking their advice. Another source of great help in the UK is the Royal College of Psychiatrists website. There's, there are a lot of resources on that website for help with particular mental health issues. So, back to you, Tim. Uh, so our final section will be on resilience. This is a word which has various meanings, and here's two meanings. The, the lower one is to do with things, materials, and the, the upper one is to do with people or maybe organisations. And what they have in common is the capacity to recover. So how do we get resilience? We're going to move on to a biblical perspective. In a moment, I'm going to be asking John to read from 1 Kings. So this is a story of Elijah. He's just had some remarkable miracles involving mountains and fire and bulls and priests dancing and chanting and, and that sort of thing. But he's now on the run. He's fearing his life. So you may want to um, follow this if you, if you have the passage to hand or just listen to John. What I'd like you to consider while you're listening to this is what is it that restores Elijah? And when John has, has, has finished reading, I'm going to be asking you to put some bullet points in the chat function. So, um, yes, John, please. Now, Elijah was afraid, and he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, along to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father. <coughs> and he lay down and slept under a broom. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, else the journey will be too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went into the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thy altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still 
a small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So, would people like to use the chat function to consider this question about what restores Elijah in this passage? Food, water, drink, sleep, being cared for, food again, anything else, sleep, time, rest, a new mission, uh, the presence of God, listening in a quiet place, time to reflect, rest under a tree, quiet, feeling safe, hearing the still, small voice of God. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry if I missed any of those as they were as quickly coming up. Mother Nature, yes, indeed. And I think some of us may well have been sort of, when we've been talking in our small groups about our coping mechanism, have been mentioning, certainly in my group, these things were being mentioned. So what restores Elijah? So as we said, sleep, rest, food, drink. We may want to consider while we watch this, what restores us? And so apart from these things, solitude, that was mentioned in our group, um, space connection, connection with other people, a change of scene. I think it's so important, isn't it? When uh, when we were oppressed, we, this was, these are all things which we've been just been hearing about in our groups. Sometimes a change of perspective too is really important. Someone else to actually just see things. We can get so easily um, sort of channeled into the way we're seeing things, into quite negative thoughts. And sometimes it needs someone else, not to just say cheer up, but just to show things from a different way. And of course, there's that still small voice speaking tenderly into our hearts. And what one prayer for today is that, that that still small voice will be speaking into our hearts, whispering into us when we are troubled and also prompting us when there are things we need to do. So well-being and resilience have been strongly connected. And there's been a huge amount of research, much ink has been written as, and much has been said about well-being. Here's just one of the sort of models. So these are five ways to well-being. Connecting, connecting with other people and indeed connecting with God. Activity is really important, keeping active. Taking notice, I'd really like to highlight this one. There's two aspects to the taking notice. One is the living in the present. It's easy to think about the past, and if you're me, very easy to think about the future and be missing the present, what's happening right now. But the other aspect of taking notice is taking, looking outside, not just looking inside. So it's being in the present and taking a notice of what's happening outside, whether that's Mother Nature or whether that's other people. That's just such an important part of well-being. And then finally, there's giving, whether it's giving of your time or your emotional energy or even of your money. There's been some um, interesting research. We've talked about burnout quite a lot and figures have come that one in five physicians in, I think this is United States, are burnt out. So the research turns this on its head. And what about the four in five who aren't burnt out? What are their strategies that keep them resilient? And the list is quite similar, being connected with people, reflection we haven't mentioned yet, so being prepared to consider what's going on, life events that's going on, and reflecting, what can I learn from this? What does this tell me about the world? Knowing our limitations is really important. Taking time out, we've mentioned already. And then finally, spirituality. And these are things which can help people, give people resilience. But there is a problem. Is resilience just yet one more competency we have to achieve? I've never looked like Superman, but at times I may have felt that way, both in professional and personal life. And there is a pride issue here, but I wouldn't want to take that away from people. This is one of the buzzes that makes healthcare just so great, is the feeling that we're giving, we're helping people. And that's fantastic when it's working. But the problem is what happens if it's not working? 
happens, we feel a failure to be resilient. Just one more thing to heap upon ourselves. Is this just one more thing to be guilty about when things are not going well and we can't even be resilient? So I'd like to think about it from some other perspectives. This is a quote misattributed to both Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill. Neither, I believe, said it. Um, I don't know a huge amount about Abraham Lincoln's life, but I do know that Winston Churchill, well known for his spectacular successes, also had spectacular failures both before and after these successes. And the ability, despite failure, to pick up and remain enthusiastic is an important characteristic. But we can't all be Churchill, we can't all have his boundless enthusiasm and optimism. If you feel at this stage of the, the day you've just looked at too many words, concentrate on the picture then below. This is Lucy, who is a Girl Scout at a far-right demonstration in Czechoslovakia on May Day uh, two or three years ago. Uh, what a lovely picture of strength with weakness, standing up to this most unpleasant looking man on the left. Chris Johnston, who this quote comes from, is a doctor who burnt out, picked himself up and now spends quite a lot of time um, helping other people either to prevent burnout or to pick them up once they have burnt out. And the central part of this statement is that we are all born weak. How do we respond to our inherent weakness? Well, you can almost deny it and just respond with an air of strength and confidence, but he suggests that greater strength may begin with the acceptance of our weakness. So um, Louise Uni is a, a good friend of Prime's, and she has identified three ways of us managing our weakness. One is awareness, just being aware of how we are in all our strengths and all our weaknesses. The second one is seeing with, and this is reflection, back to reflection, seeking help, being prepared to say, put your hands up and say, I need help to the person around you. Don't wait like I did for one of my partners to actually to, to say I needed help, I needed some time out. And finally, solidarity, act like my partner did and actually show solidarity, help, be prepared to help each other. Um, and I'm going to ask John now to read a shorter biblical passage, which is something I draw on so much. John. The Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weak insults, hardship, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Thank you, John. I think such an important message to take home from our seminar today is there is strength in weakness. There is no shame in weakness. So I would encourage anyone who's finding themselves in a time of weakness to dwell on this passage. Uh, and finally, this is a picture which illustrates two of Louise's last three points, seeking help and solidarity, helping each other. And I'm now going to hand over to Andy. We're going to move for the final time into our breakout groups for five minutes to consider two questions about resilience. So without more ado, I think we'll go into our breakout groups for five minutes and then we're going to come back together for 10 minutes plenary to share. Um, Alex, your group, could um, somebody feed back? So I'm going to appoint Nikki now to just feed, feed <laughs> back a couple of points. I think that's quite difficult at the moment um, because it basically that first question made me want to burst into tears. So I'll stop with that. Okay. And Brian, do you want to add one more? It's, it's difficult if um, sometimes you raise an issue and then people just say it's your problem. And that's really hard because it's where do you go from there? Because, you know, 
yeah, and, and that's a really hard place. So to be told you need to be more resilient is like just making you 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 know making it your problem as opposed to a system problem or whatever. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, Rob Sadler, your group. Um, can I ask you to feedback? We didn't have much time for the second question either, but fine. Hugh, can you just mention a couple of things? I'm sorry, Rob, I've forgotten what we actually said about the second question. Well, but the, no, the second question, we didn't say much at all, it's the first question. Yeah, well, our reaction, I guess, was similar to Nikki's. We all felt it would be very upsetting, uh, make us angry, make us feel failures, make us feel uh, under pressure inappropriately. So on. Thank you. Um, John, Arrow, your group. One thing on the second question, that if you share weakness and then you find that you're supported and, uh, and appreciated in that, it actually creates loyalty and teamwork, which strengthens everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tim, what about your group? I think we were quite rude. Um, we, 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 I think Anita was, was the most polite person by saying, get lost. So the, uh, and the, uh, the rest of us felt, uh, didn't express, but, but, but felt stronger words uh, about that. Uh, we thought it was actually that the whole strength and weakness thing was actually really quite difficult and was quite easy to say, a bit harder to put in practice. But we did say that maybe seeking help would be there and setting up a culture where we could admit our weakness. And that comes down to the leaders. Thank you, Tim. Um, Roy, Joseph, your group. I forgot to appoint a spokesman, so I won't arrow now. I'll just share what was said. One was anger. Then was, if I'm resilient, that means that is going to lead me to the next problem. And the third was, tell me more and maybe give me time to reflect. Hmm. Thanks, That's great. great. Um, Janet. Kara is going to be back. <clears throat> Um, we had similar feelings to everyone else about the first question. Um, and for the second question, we thought that if that our weakness or identifying our weakness and acknowledging our weakness could help us and facilitate us looking to God for strength from him first, and also that identifying and acknowledging our weakness would make it more comfortable for others to share their weaknesses as well. Thank you, Cara. That's really helpful. Thank you. And um, my group, um, uh, could um, somebody feed back from my group? Yes. I think for the first question, we had very much the same um, anger, yet another thing I haven't learned to do well enough yet. We heard a bit about a peer support system um, in somebody's workplace. And we also talked about being honest with ourselves but also actually sharing stuff with others. Often you find other people feel exactly the same, and going through exactly the same, and that brings a sense of solidarity. Thank you, Andrew, very much. Um, and I think there's one other final group. I think it's ours. Sorry. No, it's okay. And uh, um, Sharon's going to just share a few words about what we said. Thanks, Sharon. Well, in our group, we majorly had uh, a few points. We talked of a reaction to resilience. One would react as irritated and they would request that person to tell them how should he deal with that resilience. And another point was to identify time, taking time off to think about it and get a resolution. Then the third point was also giving time to reflect reflect about the, re the issue of resilience to find a way forward. And uh, our second question, we didn't really dwell much about it. We didn't get time for it. Great. Thank you, Sharon, very much. There's been a lot of to reflect today. And I think I just wanted to share with you that this is, the whole morning has been an expression, I hope we've sought it be an expression of our care for you and for your colleagues, that each one of us is important and understood, has weaknesses. 
But important also is to realize that we each have a ministry to care for our colleagues, a calling. And if anybody wants to use these seminars, um, to pass this on in their own environment, whether whatever culture, because I think this goes across all the cultures, and, um, you're very welcome to ask. And I think that would be a very wonderful way of spreading this whole vision of Prime, which is to express the kingdom of God, the presence of God, the presence of Jesus and his values as a foundational, um, a foundational element of our professional care rather than add on at the side. May we just pray together for a moment mm -hmm. and then let folk feel free to go. But if you're just longing to share and be with people who think likewise, you will always be a member of the family of Prime. So let's just pray together. Father, the still small voice, the silent voice, and yet the heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament speaks of all your glory. And in the silence, Lord, the, your voice goes out. And so I just pray, Lord, that your voice and your care and your shepherding and your resilience and your restoration will continue with all our friends here and that we will be strengthened by all that we've heard and given the courage and the determination to go on out into the world, to live and work to your praise and glory. And so may God's blessing rest upon each one of us, on those whom we love, but also on our work, our professional work, our colleagues, our environment that we're in, so that we might see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, to the glory of God. Amen.